If you have a copy of God's Word with you, open with me to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9, and just a quick note before we jump into it. Uh, if you haven't been tracking along with this series in Ezra with us since the beginning, it's important to know that Ezra and Nehemiah in the Jewish canon are one book. They're not two separate books. So in our Bibles, we see them Ezra, then Nehemiah. But in the Jewish mind, these would have been considered one book together. So we are not just doing a series on Ezra. We're doing a series on Ezra and Nehemiah. And we are coming to the end of Ezra in the next two weeks. We'll be in Ezra 9 this week, Ezra 10 the next week. And then we'll be straight into Nehemiah to pick up on that continuing story to study the rest of that book together. So we will probably be in Ezra and Nehemiah for another, I don't know, 10, 12 weeks, maybe more. I never know exactly how these things go. I started out this week thinking, we're going to cover chapters 9 and 10. And then I got into 9, I was like, that's not happening, because there's too much good stuff in 9 to do 9 and 10. So we're just doing Ezra chapter 9 today, and then uh, we will press on from there. So why don't we pray together, and then we're going to jump right in this morning. Let's pray. Father, we ask for illumination now. God, we... We, in fact, we need illumination now uh, because without your Holy Spirit opening our eyes to understand the truth of your word, we will not understand it the way that you intend for us to. So God, please help us. We come to your word for instruction. We come to your word for conviction over our sin. And we come to your word for hope that we cannot find in ourselves. And so, God, please, we ask, open our eyes to understand the scriptures this morning. Help us by your Holy Spirit, Lord. God, I, I pray that... Uh, this would not just be perhaps another week that we would come and hear a little bit of truth and leave here and forget what you spoke to us by tomorrow, but that you would deal with us today as your people. We need that, Lord. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're looking for a title? Praying with a man of God. Praying with a man of God. In 2019, the New York Times published an article by a writer named Julia Shears. And she wrote in that article what could really be considered an anthem for the modern age. The article was originally titled, I Raised My Kid Without Sin. I raised my kid without sin. And in the article, Shears goes on a rampage against religion, insisting that religion is little more than a bunch of bigoted, vile, oppressive monsters using their own concept of God to exercise a form of abuse on anyone who happens to get in the way of their own personal agenda. And one of the ways that religion does this is by using this category of sin. Listen to just a little bit of the article. She writes, The notion of sin dominated my girlhood. Raised in Indiana by fundamentalist parents, sin was the inflexible yardstick by which I was measured. Actions, words, even thoughts weren't safe from scrutiny. The list of sinful offenses seemed infinite. Listening to secular music or watching secular television, saying gosh or darn or geez. Questioning authorities, envying a friend's rainbow array of Izod shirts. God was a megaphone bleeding in my head. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad. I had recurring nightmares of malevolent winds tornadoing through my bedroom. A metaphor, I now realize, for an invisible and vindictive God. Now, if you're paying attention to the direction of our culture 
as a whole right now at all, you understand what I mean when I say that this article might as well be put to some really trendy music and be sung as our nation's new national anthem. Because we live in a world that wants to push away any concept of sin. They want to do away with it. Let's redefine it, categorize it differently. We don't need religion to tell us why we have certain problems. Let's use some certain psychological methods. Let's define it differently. Let's do away with what has long been labeled a struggle with sin. Why? Now, why does our world tend in that direction? It's because at the root of it, we're in a world that desperately wants to do away with any threat to any individual living in whatever manner they choose without fear, without guilt, without shame, and ultimately then without God. As one author put it, ours is a world of smug complacency. It's as if you pointed out an old lady, or it's as if if you pointed out to an old lady at a garden party that there's an escaped lion 20, year, 20 yards off. And she were to reply, oh, yes, and grab another cucumber sandwich. I wonder, is that your view of sin, my friend? And might I suggest to you that any misunderstanding that we have of the weight of sin is not because we misunderstand often the nature of sin itself primary. Primarily, the reason we don't understand sin is because we don't know God. You see, our belittling of sin is always a direct result of our lack of belief in God. It's a skewed perception of whether there is a God and if there is a God, what that God is like. And if we're rightly oriented to the truth, okay, and here is the truth, is that Jesus Christ himself is the image of the invisible God and that he actually came into this world and he actually resurrected from the dead in a real historical moment and then he revealed to us by way of his preaching and by way of his miraculous resurrection that he was in fact the God man the second person of the trinity and that he himself in his physical body ascended before the eyes of hundreds of eyewitnesses up into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, and that he has now sent out his Holy Spirit, who does his continued work in our lives, who convicts us of sin and confronts us in our wrongdoing, who teaches us the reality of who God is in his infinite holiness. It is only when our conception of God is right and true that we begin to understand the seriousness of our sin before a divine, omnipotent, holy being. If you want to get away, with, do away with sin and guilt, do away with the biblical God. But if the biblical God is true, you must deal with your sin and your guilt. Ezra, the man who wrote the book that we're looking at, I believe, was a man who knew God. He knew God because he was a man who, remember, was devoted to the word of God. Remember, we saw when Ezra was introduced in Ezra 7, 6, it says that Ezra was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses. That's the word of God that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And then if you skip down in chapter 7 to verses 9 and 10, we see, For the good hand of his God was on him, talking about Ezra, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and his rules in all of Israel. See, for every person that you see mocking sin and thus mocking the God who the sin is against, I'll show you someone who is in the dark as to the truth of who God is. And here's the thing, church, we can't really judge them. Because we were once just like them, too. We once had no regard for the sin in our hearts. We disregarded it. We didn't take our sin as seriously as we should have. We didn't understand the holiness of God. We didn't understand even his love or his mercy or his grace either. But the more that we come to know God, the more sober we become about our own sin. 
That's the pattern we see in scripture. And this morning, we are going to see a godly man's response to the wreckage of sin. Ezra sets an example for us of how every man and woman of God ought to respond when sin is threatening our lives or our families or our church. And I'll tell you right now, this is not the kind of passage that is going to leave you with the warm fuzzies today. This is not the kind of passage that's going to waft you out on a nice warm cloud after the service today. Instead, this is the sort of text that ought to slam you onto your knees in confession and prayer before a holy God. This text, as we walk through it, has three major divisions. First, we're going to see the news. Second, we're going to see the godly man's immediate response. And then third, we're going to see the godly man's prayer. So first, let's see the news. You may remember that last week we finished off chapter 8 on what you might consider to be a little bit of a high note in the story. God's people have just re-entered the land, and they're gathering to restore the worship of their God and the place that God has provided to dwell with his people. And then, almost immediately following their arrival, the newcomers get a sobering sort of punch in the gut. Look at chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. After these things had been done... The officials approached me and said, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves, for their sons, So that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. What you see happening here is a report from those who had just arrived into the land. Remember, there were already a bunch of Jews who were in the land. And a new wave comes with Ezra. And this new wave discovers that the situation with the Israelites who had been in the land for decades at this point was not good. Okay, so remember, Ezra is part of this second wave of returned exiles. The first wave of the exiles that we saw at the beginning of Ezra came about 80 years before, during the reign of Cyrus the Great. And that first wave came to rebuild the temple and finally accomplish that task. And now Ezra is coming as a second wave to restore the worship of God in that temple. So there's a lot of excitement going on, okay? This is a really exciting time. Everything seems really happy and good, and it is the sort of, you know, happy praise and worship sort of moments that you sometimes experience in the Christian life where you're just like, man, this is so joyful and, and good. And then comes devastating news. And the news is that these Israelites who have been in the land for 80 years had started to intermarry with pagan women. Now, there are two places in the law of Moses where this is warned against. And the first is in Exodus 34, and the second is in Deuteronomy 7. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Exodus 34, just so that we can look at one of these examples to see what's going on. Exodus 34. And we're going to look at verses 10 to 16. Exodus 34, 10 to 16. We're going to read all this together just to see why this is a problem in the first place. Because this is the law that God had given through Moses. Exodus 34, starting in verse 10. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. This is God speaking. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as has not, such as have not Uh, been created in all the earth or in any nation and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you observe what I command you this day behold I will drive out before you the Amorites the Canaanites the Hittites the Perizzites the Hivites and the Jebusites 
Take care lest you make covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You see where Ezra is getting his concern from here? The Lord directly commanded them, watch out that you do not do this. And Ezra was a man that knows the law inside out. So you can see why the law, the, this problem is even described in terms that people who knew the law would have understood. Because what we read in Ezra sounds exactly what we, like what we just saw in, in Exodus 34. You see what's happening here. This is what this command is all about. God's people are called to be a holy, set-apart nation. Why? Well, listen to that first verse we just read in Exodus 34. Verse 10, we see that God is making a covenant with his people. Do you know what a covenant is? A covenant is just a binding agreement. It's an arrangement made between two parties, an agreement that would say, I will do this, you will do this. And so God chooses... By his grace to enter into a covenant relationship with Israel again and again throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And the purpose of entering the covenant with Israel was that he would make them his special and blessed people. Do you see that? He says, Israel, I will do marvels through you. Even as such as has never been seen on the earth. You are going to receive the most unbelievable blessing of having the God who made everything pour out constant grace and loving kindness upon you. Why does God say he's going to do that through Israel? Well, he says it right there in the text. So that all of the world will look at what I am doing through you and will give glory to me. You see, the, the plan that's being laid out here is God would draw the world to himself by setting apart a holy people who he is going to accomplish glorious things to. Things through. But here's the catch, right? Israel, you've got to be holy. You've got to be holy. If you want this blessing, you have got to be holy. You must not commit horrible sin, which usually is running after other false gods or false idols. And then if you know your Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, we learn that one of the fastest paths to ditching Yahweh for other gods, listen to this, is to get involved romantically with a person who loves false gods and false idols. One of the fastest ways that your heart will be pulled into the foolishness of false worship is to fall in love with somebody who loves false gods and not the one true God. That's why God is warning against intermarriage. Look, listen closely. The issue here is not really about the Jews protecting a superior bloodline. Okay? The issue is, is with them not chasing after false gods. That's the problem. Think about it. Moses himself, who wrote Exodus that we just read, Moses himself, the chosen instrument of God to lead Israel out of Egypt in the first Exodus, Moses himself had a non-Jewish wife. Did you know that? Moses had a non-Jewish wife. And then there are other examples, such as Ruth and Boaz, who in both, in that particular example, that's a non-Jew marrying a Jew, and the relationship is celebrated it's not condemned okay so there's nothing wrong with jews marrying non-jews the problem was not with marrying non-jews the problem was with marrying non-jews who worshiped false idols and false gods so even in the old testament we see that non-jews 
are welcome into the covenant community of God if they lay aside their false idols and covenant with Yahweh. They're included in. So what's happening then in Ezra's day? The people who had returned in the first wave of exiles are already beginning to chase after false gods. They're already beginning to chase after false gods. And that's happening because they're marrying pagan women, probably for their own political and financial advantage. And so we see this is not just a problem with a few people on the fringes of society. The faithlessness is happening among, it says, the chief men, the most prominent men, are foremost committing this assault against their God by marrying and embracing the false gods of the women of the land. So what you see happening is God's people, instead of being this holy people that they're supposed to be, they're rebelling against God again. They are spiritually drifting into apostasy. The world is luring them in. The enemy has set a trap for them, and they are caught in it. Now, church, do you know how easy it is for your soul to be lured into idolatrous worship? Do you know how easy and quickly that can happen in your own heart? The root problem here in Ezra, you must see, is that the leading men and thus all the people are more in love with the world than they are with Yahweh. They have lost their purpose. Yahweh set them apart, be fully devoted to me. But the people say, no, 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 I would rather chase after riches and power and beautiful women than set my heart on Yahweh alone. In short, they're compromising holiness for an ungodly form of happiness. That's what's occurring here. They're exchanging true joy for temporal, worldly pleasure. And church, if you are not tethered to the living word of God, you will do the same. You will. Your soul is like a light, fluffy, little helium balloon that is outside in your backyard on a windy day. And we've all seen those little helium balloons floating away off into the blue sky above. Perhaps some child had their little outdoor birthday party and the balloon somehow became untethered from its anchor and within an instant it was gone. And in a fallen world, your soul is like that. Okay? If you start ignoring God's word and you begin to listen to people in this world who disregard God they worship a different God than you they have no regard for the one true God you will find yourself floating away in an instant you'll be gone with the wind and if you begin to take the advice of those who want you to greedily make as much money as you can in this life better yourself right all these business podcasts that are out there Go get yours, make your money, get rich, or die trying, right? But those people have no love for God, and you start to intake all their stuff and not even give a second thought to whether or not it aligns with what God's word teaches is right and true, you're going to end up making decisions in your life that will lead to your destruction. Or perhaps you'll begin disregarding God by flirting with a non-believer at work. Or for, for some of you, you children and students out there, start flirting with non-believers who don't worship Yahweh like you do at school. And you're going to find yourself so quickly having your heart pulled away into false religion. So fast, your soul will fly away into destruction. If you spend hours of your time, listen, consuming social media, consuming content on YouTube or Instagram or wherever you follow, whatever influencers you follow, and you never filter what those influencers are saying through the living word of God, you listen to them, in fact, more than you listen to your God through his word, I am telling you the winds of the world will swoop you up and carry you away to your eternal destruction and your joy in God will be gone. You must 
remain, like Ezra, tethered to the truth of God in the Bible. You must know and love and obey your God. Listen, you cannot mix the worship of the one true God with any other philosophy or religion of man. You can't do it. It's Yahweh or nothing. Jesus or nothing. And if you try to mix him with other beliefs and philosophies and worldviews and whatever else, what you're really doing is you're saying, you know what, I'm going to taint this, fault, this pure religion for something false, and therefore you're going to fall into the exact same position of the returned exiles in Ezra. Now, church, you're going to have one of two reactions to all this today, and you need to know that. You will either allow the word of God this morning to cut you to the heart for all of the ways that you are compromising in your life right now, and you will return to the worship of Yahweh, or you will blow all this off, and you're going to continue loving the world more than you love the one true God. And Ezra leads us to the right response. Let's look at division number two in this text. The godly man's immediate response. The godly man's immediate response. See if I can get to it. We're going to look at verses 3 to 5. As soon as I heard this, Ezra writes, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard, and I sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn, and I fell upon my knees, and I spread out my hands to the Lord my God. You see, when a congregation of people truly comes into the presence of God, truly, it most assuredly doesn't look like what you tend to see at things like a Hillsong United concert. Okay? It doesn't look like waves of emotion that are provoked by some musical synthesizer hitting just the right sound wave. When the awe of God falls upon a people, it most often looks like stunned, sobered, convicted silence, where the only noise that could be heard in the room is the weeping of sinners who were so deeply convicted in their soul that they cannot help but cry out for mercy. True weeping before the Lord begins with a proper fear and awe of God. These people, along with Ezra, are weeping because they tremble at the words of the God of Israel. You see that in the text? Those who were weeping were those who tremble at his words. In the light of God's holiness, they are offended by the faithlessness of the people of God, of which they are corporately included. So in other words, they are confronted with a perfect, awful, awesome, holy presence of God. And they realize that they are a sinful people before him. And so what response can there be for sinners to do at times, but just to fall on your face before God and weep? See, Ezra hears about this sin that the people are committing. And it says he tears his garment. He tears his cloak. He pulls out his hair. He pulls out his beard. And he sits there in stunned silence, appalled. This was the action taken in the ancient Near East to express the deepest sense of grief. You think about the moment that you were most struck with an instant sense of grief in your life that's what's occurring here with Ezra 
That word that says that Ezra sat appalled means that Ezra is stupefied. He's stunned. He's devastated. He's horrified. Now, church, I just want to speak really directly to you this morning. Listen to me closely. If you've been zoned out at any point, come back right now. If you have never been driven to a deep point of despair over your sin before a holy God that resembles something like this, I really doubt you know God at all. If your religion has never been much more than going through the motions and coming to church and having a few nice relationships with some people and trying to be a good person and doing what you can to improve your life and enjoying the feeling that you get from being a part of something that feels bigger than yourself and you have never been driven to the point of despair where all you can do is fall on your knees realizing you are a horrible and wretched sinner before a holy God, then you simply do not know God. You've got to hear what I'm saying this morning. Do you know him? The God of the scriptures is not a God like us, okay? You, you do not approach him like he's just another fallen creature like you are. He is perfectly holy. We see in Isaiah chapter 6 that this God is surrounded by celestial angels whose only duty is to praise him day and night. And those very angelic creatures are so magnificent that any time in the Bible that they appear before men, the men freak out in fear and want to run away and hide. But even those angelic beings, as mighty and even as sinless as they are, when they come into the presence of this perfect holy God, they have wings that are designed specifically to keep their face covered before him because they dare not stare upon his glory. Do you really presume? That as a sinful creature whose heart has been set against the holiness of God for your whole life, that you will one day waltz up to him and not be consumed by the fire of his holiness? Hebrews 12, 29 reminds us, our God is a consuming fire. Okay, we live 91 million miles away from the sun. And it doesn't look all that intimidating from here. But even in 91 million miles away, the sun can burn your eyes out in under two minutes. But if you were to take a rocket and blast off and set your course to try to get closer to this sun yourself, you wouldn't get within several million miles of its loud and hot and fearsome burning gases before you literally melted to death. And you think that you're going to come into the presence of the God who spoke that sun into existence and who upholds the burning heat of every star in the sky every second of every day. But the Bible reveals again and again that we have infinitely offended the only true God by disregarding this God, this creator God's truth, to chase after our own sinful desires. Oh, church, we would do well to stop taking our religion so frivolously and to allow ourselves to tremble before this almighty creator God. Do you realize that for the true Christian? There should be regular times when God's word reveals sin in our own hearts that it just causes us to fall down with our face covered before him, weeping before him. Have you been there? Has that been something that's ever happened to your heart and soul? And what I'm trying to tell you is if you know God, you have been there. You have been there. Your religion is true. If that's occurred to you, you've actually had a confrontation with the true God. If you've been so cut to the heart that you can't stand but weep before his holiness. And if that has not ever happened to you, hear of this God this very morning and tremble before him. We see here Ezra weeps. He hears about this sin and he 
weeps. And moved by God through the leadership of Ezra, others begin to just weep with him. There was a Scottish preacher in the 1800s by the name of Robert Murray McShane. And he only preached from the age of 29, or 23 to 29 because he struggled with physical health almost his whole life and he died at the young age of 29. And the candle of his life didn't burn long, but boy, if you read his stuff, it burned bright. McShane was perhaps most known for being an earnest man of prayer. He spent countless hours interceding on behalf of his people in his city. He begged God. He begged God continually. In fact, if you go and visit the places where he used to minister, they even have these prayer altars set up where he used to lay down. And if you were to go and tour those altars, the people there will tell you this is where he wept every day. This is where he wept, praying that God would show mercy on the sinners all around him. And by God's grace, from 1839 to 1842, much of Scotland was turned upside down by a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit of God. And this wasn't a movement that was generated by the happy excitement of young people who wanted to get in with a cool trend that was going on. It wasn't a way that you were going to gain credibility and social capital because it wasn't really popular to be one of these committed Christians back then. This was a movement that was characterized by wailing and weeping. McShane preached of sin directly, and he led men to Christ, who was the only hope of salvation from sin, as quickly as he could get them there. He urged men to flee from your sin and come to Christ, who alone can save you. And McShane recorded in his journals what the nature of many of these meetings was like. He wrote, It was like a pent-up flood breaking forth. Tears were streaming from the eyes of many. And some fell on the ground groaning and weeping and crying for mercy. This isn't the kind of stuff that you see forced within the charismatic movement these days. This is a holy and quiet congregation that is confronted with the holiness of God and it breaks them. And they fall on their faces and they say, we are unworthy of you. And at other times, men and women were so overcome with grief and conviction that they literally had to be carried out of the church. It says, in some areas, whole congregations were frequently moved as one man. And the voice of the minister was drowned out by the cries of anxious souls. And it said that McShane's voice and eyes and gestures always spoke of the tenderness of Christ. It was, it was not... Robert Murray McShane that the people saw in these moments, they saw Jesus. And McShane declared, a man cannot be a faithful minister until he preaches Christ for Christ's sake, until he gives up striving to attract people to himself and seeks only to attract them to Christ. And I would say, oh, that we would pray that God would raise up more men and women of God who so deeply long to lead sinners to the tender mercies of Christ See the weight of your sin and fly to the only one who can save you. And what we see happening in Ezra is that that is Ezra's deepest desire. He longs that God's people would trust in their God. That they would know the immeasurable benefits of his blessing that gets poured out when they are his covenant people. He's saying, lay aside your foolish things that you're trying to cling to in this world and cling only to the promises of God. And so Ezra does what any godly man ought to do when sin is wrecking his church. He does what any godly man or woman ought to do when sin is wrecking your family and wrecking your city and wrecking everything all around you. What does he do? He falls on his knees. He spreads out his hands and he prays. He prays. So third, we see a godly man's prayer. Look at verse, chapter 9, verse 6 to 15. Ezra prays, O oh my God, 
I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, to utter shame as it is today. But now for a brief time, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place that our God might brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery, for we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure, with the impurity of the peoples of the land, and with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanliness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat of the good land, and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us, uh, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just. For we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. That's a godly prayer. Let me just make a few observations from this prayer. First, notice Ezra's personal humility. Notice his personal humility. Ezra begins his prayer by saying, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our hearts and our guilt has mounted up before the heavens. You see, Ezra isn't approaching God with any sort of man God. Those people over there can just not get it together. He doesn't have that sort of attitude. He isn't drawing a division between those who are the good and holy and righteous ones in the land and the rest of the losers who need to keep to themselves over there. Ezra knows that he personally is unworthy to stand before God. And boy, any preacher today better realize that too. I might be on a stage that's four steps up, but that doesn't make me above you morally in any sense whatsoever. I am a sinner before God just as much as any person in this room is. But Ezra knows that he personally can't stand before the Lord, and he knows that because he studies the Bible. He understands God's holiness. Listen, the most holy men in the Bible are always denied the opportunity to look God square in the face, so to speak. Even Moses, who is God's chosen instrument, is only permitted to take a tiny glimpse at the fleeting presence of God as it, so to speak, leaves the room. You can't see too much of me, Moses, or it will consume you. The most holy men are desperately unworthy before a holy God. And there's a warning here in the way that Ezra prays that we must guard against self-righteousness. If you find yourself getting older and thinking that you are becoming more and more righteous and other people are just way less than you are, you are not being confronted with the holiness of the only true God. The more you know his holiness, the more you realize how sinful you are in comparison to him. Knowing him drives you to humility. It makes you realize I am unworthy 
before him. That's the first thing to notice. Second thing to notice is notice Ezra's understanding of the covenant. Notice his understanding of the covenant in the prayer. He's praying according to his understanding of the Mosaic covenant. The agreement is that God, as we've already talked about, will pour out blessing on his people if they will love him with their whole heart and soul and mind and strength and obey his commandments. So if his people have faith in God's promises and they rely on him completely for everything, then they're going to remain in a state of abounding, a state of blessing before their God. So Ezra recognizes that Israel as a people is now violating once again their end of the agreement with God. And you remember the last time that they disobeyed God? As it recounts here, it resulted in judgment. The last time that they went against God's commands, it resulted in God raising up foreign powers to conquer Israel and to carry them off to captivity. So how then could this stubborn people not have learned their history lesson? And before you think that this is just the threatening of a vindictive God, you need to remember that God is not the offender here. God is not the traitor. God is not the cheater. He's not the liar. He's not the glory thief here. God has always remained faithful to uphold the agreement to his people. He has remained unnecessarily patient and kind towards us in a human sense. Despite our, common rebellion, our, our constant rebellion against him, man is the offender of the covenant here, not God. God has perfectly upheld his end of the arrangement. Man, in sin, consistently does not. And Ezra understands that, which leads us to the third observation of his prayer. Notice Ezra's sincere confession. Notice his sincere confession. Ezra confesses on behalf of the people of God here. In verse 10, he says quite plainly, And now, O our God, what, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets. And that command, of course, was to be holy. Be, be a set-apart people. That's what the prophet said. It is a command to you, Israel, and to you, church, as well, to not taint your calling to remain loyal to God, who pours out his infinite blessing upon you. And so Ezra confesses on behalf of Israel. He confesses on behalf of Israel. And we see here that it is important that the church sees herself, not just as a collection of individuals, but as a corporate whole. Okay, church, we are one body in Christ. We are one people with one holy calling to the gospel. So where there is sin in the church, listen to this. Where there is sin in the church among any individual, that is not just a problem for the individual. That is a problem that taints the whole church. That's why it's so important that in a church, we belong to one another. That's why it's so important that any individual Christian truly belongs to the church. Because in the church, we submit our lives to accountability with brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing that we are all one in the Christian life. The Christian life is not an individual pursuit. It's something you do together with all of those that God has called as his own to himself. There's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. You can't do it. You can't do it faithfully. And this is also why, church, you must be confessing your sins to brothers and sisters in Christ who are praying for you and are helping you kill the sin that remains within you. Because when you're living in rebellion against God's law and you're not bringing that sin into the light, you are tainting the witness and the power of the church, whether you realize it or not. You are bringing a darkness into the body of Christ that, that spiritually hinders her from being a holy blessing to the world. Don't think that your sin only has consequences to you in your private life. There's a spiritual reality that your sin left in the dark, not confessed and brought into the light with God's people causes to hinder 
humanly speaking, the work of God in the world. So this is why we must reject the modern notion that we're fully autonomous beings, that we can just do whatever we want to do and live however we want to live, and nobody can tell us otherwise. We should be challenging one another constantly in the church in a loving but, but constant way to live to the Lord. I mean, if you care about the glory of God and the witness of his people, then you're going to get into the business of fellow believers' lives. You will lovingly care about their holiness. You will challenge them on what they're listening to, on what they're watching, on how they're using their time, on what God is teaching them in his word. What is he teaching you right now? You need to tell me what he's teaching you. Are you in his word? You're not in his word? Are you believing the lies of the world? What are you listening to? Oh, you're listening to that, bo- that business podcast for 20 hours a week? And you're reading your Bible for 20 minutes? That might explain some of the obsession with thinking that it's okay to just skip out on Sunday mornings every week because you're working and earning money and doing what you want to do. That's loving confrontation. And if you don't see that as loving confrontation, it's because you've started to believe that you are a fully autonomous being and nobody can tell me what they want to tell me because I can do what I want. That's not Christianity. It's not Christianity. If we really desire church to be a holy people of God, then not only do we need to be willing to confront others, we need to be willing to open ourselves up to healthy criticism and correction. Because there's a humility before the Lord that recognizes, I'm not perfect, I need your help. Please see the sin in my life. Please see where I am drifting off into the world because I don't want to love that more than I love Jesus who saved me and died for me. So please confront me. Please don't let me drift. That's the attitude and the mindset of a, of a Christian. So we need to learn to receive that kind of correction. Are we always going to do that perfectly? You better believe no. We are not going to do that perfectly. All right, we're going to step on one another's toes. We're going to communicate imperfectly when we're trying to correct somebody. We're going to take things wrong when somebody's trying to correct us. And we need to press into those situations to bring clarity and truth to it, which is only possible if you're really a gospel-centered Christian who knows how imperfect you and everyone around you is. And so in Christ, let's seek love even when it's difficult. That's what the church does. Now, fourth and finally, notice Ezra's recognition in his prayer, of God's grace. From beginning to end, Ezra understands that God is faithful even when his people are faithless. He is gracious and he is full of steadfast love. We see that very clearly in verses 8 and 9. In those verses, Ezra is expressing that he is astounded that God has shown favor to him and to those who are allowed to return to the land in that second wave, even though all this sin was being committed by the Israelites who were part of the first wave in the land at the moment when God chose to still be gracious to the people and bring the second wave back. He's saying God's continuing to show favor to us, even though we're breaking covenant with him. It's amazing. And that is God's grace. And Ezra is astounded by it. Again, he says in verse 13, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this. You see, even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. And Ezra is working through a realization, even in his prayer. He's working through this idea that God is being gracious, but these people are still fallen. I was hopeful, as was probably thinking, that this was going to be the restoration that we had so been looking forward to, that this was going to be the time when God was going to expand his glorious kingdom over all the earth through his people. But now I see this people is so broken and sinful, and maybe this isn't exactly what we had hoped for after all. But he mentions that God in his steadfast love remains faithful to his people. And indeed, God in his steadfast love would one day send a faithful man who would completely deliver his people from their sins. And that man was none other than Jesus the Christ. So you see that God is remaining steadfast in his love toward his people, 
even right in this moment in Ezra because he is ensuring that he will preserve the Davidic line which would one day lead to the birth of the God-man who was the Messiah and the deliverer of his people. And Jesus would come as a representative of all Israel. He was the true Israel. And he remained sinless. He upheld our end of the covenant. He was steadfast in his love toward the Father in his flesh. He always did the Father's will. And he came to offer up his life as a substitution for your imperfect life so that you can be fully and completely forgiven of your sin and absolved of all of your guilt, not because you performed well enough, but because Jesus came and performed in your place. We are covenant breakers, but God keeps the covenant for us. And so when you're rightly broken in your sin, and you're left weeping before a holy God, you got to realize that there is one place that you can run. And it's not to more righteousness within yourself. The one place that you can run and must run is to Jesus. Because he alone is the one that can fully forgive you forever by the power of his grace. He is the only one who by his grace can give you the free gift of his perfect obedience in your place as the perfect Israel, which is your only hope of being declared righteous on the last day and not consumed by the fire of the wrath of God because of your sin. And so Ezra's prayer reminds me, church, of another prayer, a high priestly prayer. A a, a prayer that is prayed by Jesus himself in John 17. And and there Jesus says to the Father something that only he has ever been able to say. Even Ezra cannot utter these words. Jesus says, I have glorified you on earth. You see him in our place as the true Israel. Israel always failed. Father, I have glorified you. I upheld the end of the agreement having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And then Jesus goes on in that prayer to pray for us. He prays that those people that he has won for himself, that the Father has given to him, that he has won their redemption He prays that they would be filled with his love and continue to do his work in the world. He prays that we would be sanctified by our union with Christ, but by growing and knowing and clinging to the word of truth. You see, see, those who belong to Christ will know the love of Christ. They'll know the joy of forgiveness. They'll know That though we weep for our sins now, one day our weeping will turn into rejoicing. Our sorrow will turn into dancing. Because in Christ, we who are so utterly broken in our sin are made whole in him. It is good and right to be convicted to the heart for our sin. But you are not convicted So that you can either one, get mad at God, or either two, try to be better in and of yourself. You are convicted of your sin so that you are driven in desperation to cling to Christ alone who can save you from it. Christ alone who can save your family from it. Christ alone who can save your neighbors from it. Christ alone who can save your coworkers from sin. So church, weep and fly to him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now um, just confessing that we are sinners before you. Father, I ask that you would continue to be faithful to reveal your glory to your people. Because, Lord, we need our our sin exposed. And we need to trust Christ all the more. 
Father, I pray that even as we can get so deeply convicted of our sin, that that would actually increase our joy in Christ. Because we'll realize more and more what Jesus saves us from. He saves us from wrath. He saves us from just punishment that we deserve. Father, I pray that our church might even come to know something of the power of what occurs when your spirit brings brings such deep conviction that there's literally tears on every aisle. Father, the, the fact that we don't weep over our sin the way we should clearly shows that we don't know you the way we should. So, Father, I do pray that even as we take the, the Lord's Supper here in just a moment, that we would take it in hope that Jesus is our only, our only chance, our only salvation from our sin. And that would cause our hearts, even as we may be sorrowful of our sin, to rejoice in Christ truly. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to move to a time now of taking the Lord's Supper.